Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In 1972, a group of 100 scientists, economists, business leaders, and former politicians who named themselves Club of Rome published The Limits of Growth, a manifesto questioning our development model in light of our limited Earth resources. Where do we stand 50 years later? Definitely, there has been a mobilization of the international community with uh, summits in Rio, Kyoto, and a major step uh, in Paris COP21, where 196 countries collectively agreed to limit global warming by 1.5 Celsius degrees and setting a, a clear direction on that. Of course, following COPs made uh, additional progress and the recently closed COP27 held in Egypt agreed on the principle of a compensation fund for loss and damages from climate-induced disasters. And this came after an adaptation fund and alignments on uh, taxonomy, reporting rules, etc. This climbing warming limit goal translates into a need to drastically curb carbon emissions by the middle of the century. And at this point, some would say that failing national uh, commitments to make it happen, the net zero by 2050 remains aspirational. As a matter of fact, adapting to climate change comes with a cost. Transitioning to cleaner energy, and we've seen that with solar panels or batteries, requires massive resources, minerals and metals that are pretty scarce on Earth. There is uh, more and more the uh, perceived perception that a change in paradigm is needed when it comes to the use of natural resources. As we speak, COP15 on diversity is ongoing in Montreal with a view to sanctuarize 30% of Earth uh, on la and land and sea by 2030. On the positive side, uh, we need to acknowledge that uh, we are witnessing innovation at a pace that is historically high <coughs> across all domains. <coughs> this is thanks to new technologies, but also with available new resources coming in particular from the venture capital and private equity industry that has turned startups into a new source of innovation, not only in the digital space, but also in more capital intensive areas like deep tech and clean tech. The good news also is that corporate world is now embracing the sustainability imperative, not only from a reporting and compliance standpoint, but as a lever to rethink the entire value chain from industrial production, operations, and business models to supply chain, of course, with technology as an enabler. Hence, the question today is not if, but how. How can we scale fast, promising technologies today in their infancy? Carbon capture technology, synthetic fuels as an example. How fast can we move transition to clean energy, wind, solar, and especially hydrogen? How can we do more with less, less leakages, less waste? And how can circular economy contribute to decarbonization and energy transition? To debate on these issues, it is my pleasure to welcome here on stage a panel that um, we are going to take a look at. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which is a mixed panel. And we have uh, one of our members, Bruno, who is normally in Visio. So I will start with you, Andrew. Andrew, you are uh, uh, a researcher at uh, OECD in particular. Uh, you've been publishing a lot of um, publications on the, um, material and how that correlates to uh, environmental impact and climate change. So, uh, can, with a, in particular a focus on waste, can you tell us more about that? 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to Song Nim and the organizers at the World Policy Conference. It's uh, an absolute honor to be here today. Uh, so yes, I think that at the OECD, we are taking a look at this interaction between the environment and economic systems. And at the core of this interaction is this sort of paradox that when we look at our economic systems, we begin to see economies of scale, that with each additional input, we see an improvement in our ability to produce. But when we consider our natural resource use, we see the exact opposite, diminishing marginal returns. And so the question becomes, how do these two relationships work with one another, and how can we find a new economic system to break free from this paradox? Uh, so at the OECD, we have done a number of studies. Uh, in particular, you can see on the right here, this is some of our work regarding um, global materials outlook. Uh, so this is taking a look at macroeconomic models and seeing what do we anticipate happening in 2060 around materials use. And so we notice a doubling in total in terms of weight of material use in 2060 compared to 2011. Uh, we noticed that uh, materials will constitute roughly one-fifth of greenhouse gas emissions in 2060. This is often when we account for demographic change and when we account for the structural changes to the economy that we anticipate, that uh, this is not going to be uniform across the economic sectors. We anticipate construction being particularly well impacted in terms of material use, which we'll hear more about later in terms of uh, concrete. And uh, we also notice the uh, increase in fossil fuel use. And so this is a question about material use that has been around and has uh, preoccupied economists for a long period of time. I think we, uh, 200 years ago, it was uh, Tourgeot from France who noticed this diminishing marginal returns when applied to agriculture. Uh, when we talked 100 years ago, uh, it was an analyst at the United States Geological Survey who mentioned that we might be facing peak oil within the next three years. This was 100 years ago. 50 years ago, you mentioned Lucia, the Club of Rome. Uh, and I think in the last 50 years, there's a bit more nuance around resource use. It's the fear has sort of developed away from a fear of exhaustion of resources into more looking at the impacts of our use of natural resources. Uh, and so when we think about these impacts, one way of thinking of this could be the planetary boundaries at the Stockholm uh, Resilience Institute and noticing biodiversity and biochemical flows, that these are areas that we've already gone be beyond what we would expect from our economic system. And we look at what's next, it's possibly land use, it's climate change. So these are big problems facing our economic system and how we use our natural resources. And when we think about what could possibly be the solution, I think one area that the OECD is very interested in is in circular economy. So this is on the left side of the screen here. You can see what we mean by circular economy. We break it down into three particular parts. We think about efficiency. How can we use natural resources more efficiently, get more economic productivity out of a certain amount of resource use? How can we slow our resource use, meaning how can we use and keep products at the highest value possible for the longest period of time possible? And then we also want to close our economic systems. We want to address the leakage of our products into the environment and the impacts that they have. Uh, so we can talk a bit more with the next slide here about applying this to one particular uh, material use, which is plastics. So I'll just wait for the next slide to appear. Can I move? But uh, essentially, we've, we've done a similar project around global materials outlook. We've done a similar one just recently with plastics use globally. Uh, so this was, uh, when we take a look at plastics, these are a ubiquitous material in modern economies. But we see this more so in the OECD countries, but uh, we anticipate growth in the use per capita in the non-OECD countries between now and 2060. So on the right side, you can see that we've estimated in 2019, that the economic system produced 460 million tons of plastics. Uh, that when we talk about why this is an issue, of that 460 uh, million tons, 350 roughly became waste in 2019. And when we consider how this growth, we also notice a growth in what is leaking to the environment. So in 2019, we estimated that roughly 22 million tons of plastics leaked into the environment. 
And when you compare that with what was recycled, we, we estimated that 9% of total plastics uh, waste was recycled in 2019. So this is a major problem facing us. And just last week, we had the first meeting of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, taking a look at a binding commitment regarding plastics, uh, which was agreed upon through the United Nations Environment Assembly. So I think this is my first intervention to describe the issues, and I look forward to describing policy solutions in the second intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm now moving to Yosung Yim, your VP, um, Vice President at the um, Corporate Strategy Center of uh, Yosung Corporation, a prominent uh, South Korean conglomerate. And what's interesting is that uh, uh, your company is already embracing natively to, so, uh, to say so, uh, recycling in all its processes. Could you tell us more about that? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Lucia. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know uh, what Hyosung does, uh, today uh, we have a very uh, diversified business por portfolio, uh, portfolio uh, ranging from textiles to energy, chemicals, and advanced materials. But, uh, but what you have to understand is that uh, Hyosung started out in 1966 as, uh, as a maker of uh, nylon and polyester fiber. And since then, uh, we have expanded these products in, into tire cords, uh, um, carpets, uh, airbags, seat belts, uh, to name just a few. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, the big portion uh, of, of our recycling program program in Hyosung it, uh, revolves around the uh, reuse of uh, pre-consumer and post-consumer uh, nylon and polyester waste. Uh, currently, uh, we can do most of the uh, mechanical recycling of uh, uh, polyester and nylon. Uh, but chemical recycling uh, is much harder. Uh, the, this is because the key uh, success factor uh, in mechanical recycling is actually securing uh, clean, uh, clean waste of nylon and uh, pet products. But uh, for chemical cycling, what you do is uh, you take contaminated, dirty uh, nylon and uh, polyester waste, and you break them down by melting it, and you have to filter out the impurities, uh, the contaminated parts. Uh, you have to single out all the other uh, com co uh, compounds that uh, you don't need, and you have to single out the, the raw material that you want to actually recycle. So this is very much, uh, much harder than uh, me mechanical recycling. And in this area, uh, Hyosung still has some work to uh, catch up. But um, I think the point that I want to make here is that, um, as you can see, uh, there are many recycled products out there already. I mean, the technology is there. But uh, the problem is, is there a demand for these products currently you know, in the market? Uh, sadly, the answer is no. Um, this is because no, one's, uh, no one is willing to pay for it. Okay? Um, a success story of one of our uh, recycled products is a product uh, named Regen, which is uh, short for regenerated fiber. Uh, what we do is uh, we take uh, uh, used PET bottles, uh, mechanically crush them, and then we use it to uh, uh, remake uh, polyester fiber from that. And uh, currently, we can't make enough of them uh, because the only limitations that we have right now is actually trying to secure more, more of the uh, used PET bottles. Uh, but as there, there's only a limited um, amount of uh, PET bottles re, uh, recirculating in the economy, uh, we are very limited. And the demand is, is there. Um, this is because um, apparel brands uh, can use 100% recycled uh, PET fiber to make, uh, to make uh, jackets and uh, a lot of clothing. But, um, but they're willing to take on these uh, higher prices, which, uh, which is about 15 or 20% higher than normal non-recycled pet products, pet fiber. Uh, they're willing to take on uh, this higher cost because uh, actually raw materials, uh, fibers, only account for 20% of the uh, price of clothing that you all wear. So 
if you factor in, factor in the pricing is only 15% higher and the raw material accounts for only 20%, the actual uh, price hikes that, that the uh, uh, apparel brands have to absorb is only 3 to 4%. But they're willing to do this because uh, the benefits of, uh, in the form of uh, uh, enhanced brand awareness and increased sales uh, from their uh, of their recycled uh, clothing is much higher than the uh, cost that they bear uh, buying uh, recycled products. But uh, this is a, a success story. But uh, the sad uh, thing is that most other uh, polyester and nylon products that we make uh, doesn't share the same story. Uh, one example is uh, uh, recycled spandex. Uh, spandex is the elastic fiber that, that uh, you put in that you mix with other fibers to give you the stretchy uh, function of your clothing. Um, the thing with uh, spandex is that uh, th you only use 10% of these uh, fibers. Uh, uh, you mix it. You mix 10% spandex with 90% uh, nylon or uh, pet pet fibers. So, uh, for apparel brands to actually uh, buy. Uh, higher costing uh, recycled spandex into their uh, uh, brands and then calling it, uh, uh, how would you say, eco-friendly products is, is really, uh, I, I don't think uh, any, uh, no uh, consumer will buy that story. So um, they're really reluctant to uh, in buying these uh, other products that, that make up only a small portion of their raw materials. So. I think uh, uh, we have to make uh, uh, we have to make more attention uh, needs to be made to increase demands for products that are already out there, uh, and I think this is uh, crucial if you want to actually get the uh, circular circular economy going as fast as we would, we would like them to. Thank you. So the the quality of what needs recycling matters, right? So uh, one of your byproducts in your industrial process is hydrogen. Uh, and you're now looking at that as not only a byproduct, but also uh, a source of energy, of course. So tell us more about that. OK. Um, as, as Lucia just said, uh, Hyosung, uh, we, we produce uh, hydrogen uh, from a, a process called uh, PPDH, the uh, hydrogenation process. Uh, what we do is we take uh, uh, a molecule of propane, and we strip it uh, with two molecules of hydrogen. And if you strip uh, propane of two molecules of hydrogen, you get a, a substance called uh, propylene. And if you uh, mix together more pro propylene with each other, it becomes polypropylene. And polypropylene is the raw material that is used, used to make thermoplastics, for example, uh, hard pipes, piping. Uh, protective films. So it is the source of uh, 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 plastics that we use every day uh, in, in our lives. But um, with the hydrogen that is uh, produced, generated in the process of making this polypropylene, what we do is uh, we are taking this hydrogen and we are actually uh, recirculating that into the economy as a fuel for mobility. Um, we're doing that currently uh, as a 50-50 joint venture with uh, Linde of, of Germany. Um, and we produce, uh, we are currently in the stages of building the liquef uh, liquefaction plant. What we're doing is we're liquefying the hydrogen gas. Um, currently, uh, all of the uh, hydrogen that is consumed within Korea right now is uh, supplied in the form of uh, gas. But you may ask, then why are you liquef liquefying it? Um, it's really about the economics. Uh, if you have a vast network of uh, pipeline that is just dedicated to the transport of hydrogen, then hydrogen, hydrogen gas makes sense. But without that network, it is far more cheaper to actually transport large amounts of uh, hydrogen to wherever you want within uh, Korea. Uh, this is uh, mainly because uh, uh, liquid hydrogen has a density which is only about one eight hundredth of hydrogen gas. This means that you can transport 13 times more uh, hydrogen 
to refueling station or wherever you need it. Uh, yes, uh, additional costs are borne because we have to actually add the li liquefaction plant. And also, uh, we have to keep the hydrogen low to minus 253 degrees uh, to, to keep it in the form of uh, liquid. Uh, yes, that adds costs to the, uh, to the uh, hydrogen costs. But the savings that we get uh, from the transportation costs far outweigh any uh, uh, rises in, in costs. So uh, what we're doing is uh, we're building a uh, hydrogen fueling station, a uh, liquid hydrogen fueling station, and we're targeting uh, non-passenger cars, bigger cars that require more hydrogen, uh, buses and trucks. And um, we are targeting opening up our plant and our uh, uh, refueling station uh, early uh, 2024. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, definitely, besides the byproduct, what is interesting in that example is that um, you become uh, an energy producer, uh, so uh, renewable, and uh, that, that's uh, that's also a change in paradigm. So coming back a while for uh, at um, recycling material, uh, let's take a look at uh, a very new approach to that. And Bruno Langlois, you're with us by by visio. Thank you for taking the time. Um, after 25 years' experience in the chemical industry, Bruno Langlois has decided to join a young but promising startup called Carbios, uh, which is developing a, a very interesting approach to not only uh, plastic recycling, but plastic regeneration. So can you tell us more, Bruno? Yes, thanks a lot for organizing this meeting and sorry for not being with you today. Uh, we need to be prepared to not to travel uh, at the last minute, and that's what happened to me. So what Carbios is doing is that uh, Carbios was inspired by nature. If you look at nature, we do not generate waste. Every material at the end of its life is converted back to virgin raw materials, and you can have a new generation of life. So Carbios has been looking at microorganisms that are typically producing enzymes, a kind of proteins, and these proteins are capable of accelerating the degradations of materials. So inspired by the nature, we have looked at the biotechnology, uh, which is developing an enzyme, which is capable of breaking down polyester, which is one kind of the plastics, which is being produced massively, about 80 million tons per year, essentially going to the packaging for one third and two thirds going to the textile industry. And this, uh, enzyme is capable of breaking down uh, this polymer back to its two constituents, the original constituents that we're using today and which are produced by oil. So in, a, in, a, in one word, what we are doing is the ability to take our waste and convert them back to raw materials to reproduce polyester one kind of plastics. And uh, you've seen the number, it's, uh, it's big numbers. So what, where we are today, and if you look at the first slide, uh, we are now at the demonstration level. So we are generating all the data which are needed to build a plant that we plan to have operational in 2025. And this plant will be able to convert about 50,000 tons. So it's quite small at the scale of what we are doing. And that will be one of my points later. But we'll be able to convert um, 50,000 tons of waste containing PET back into raw material that can be converted back into virgin-like PET. This is important. And if I move to the following slides, We are showing that on that slide that the process that we are operating, so you have a, a biological process, so an enzyme which is breaking down like a scissor, a molecular scissor, and the conversion rate is quite impressive. Huh? This, this has been 10, 10 years of work in the biotechnology, but we are capable of converting 97% of the PET present in the waste. And an important point here also is to say that we work in water in moderate uh, temperature because enzyme is something, it's a, 
it's an it's a, it's a material that doesn't work in a, in a solvent, but we're working in water. We are degrading 97% of the PET, which is present, polyester, which is present in these samples in less than 24 hours. And even if in the waste, we have other materials, and that's important because when you look at plastic, sometimes you are mixing with other materials. You have dyes, you have uh, heterogeneous materials. You, you look at your bottles, you have the label sometimes, which is made of something different. And in the textile, more particularly, you have mix of fibers, we mentioned elastin just a few minutes ago, the enzyme will only, only be able to recover what is inside the PT. So we can, we can extract without separating physically the material, uh, the, uh, what is important to remake a virgin-like polyester. The last slide, which the third slide, which is important, is of course to say that by doing that, we are diverting our waste, which we are producing massively. I mean, it's interesting to see that we have multiplied the number, the quantity of waste by 12 in the last 15 to 20 years, where only the population has been multiplied by less than three. So we're obviously going in the wrong direction in terms of producing more and more <clears throat> at a lower cost, making those objects with lesser value thrown away very quickly. For instance, in the textile industry, the average time we are wearing a textile is six times. This is an average. I'm not saying it's valid for every country. It's valid for every object, but it's showing the wrong direction in terms of waste generations. And we are diverting these materials from incineration and landfilling, regenerate, and on the life cycle analysis, we see that we are reducing the CO2 emission by 45%, roughly using no solvents and working at low temperature. And this is the layout of uh, the plants that we are building in France that will be operational, as I say, in 2025 and ramping up. Carbios is, is not gonna, Carbios will own this first plant, but the, of course the uh, Carbios is not willing to manage plants, it's a biotech. Our objective is to develop more enzymes, improve the efficiency of enzymes, to make sure that we can degrade polyamide, polyester, polyurethane, which are another type of plastics, but also the polyolefin, which is uh, a, a material which is widely used in the packaging industry. Thank you, Bruno. I think this is a perfect illustration of uh, how innovation can help think different uh, and, uh, you know, avoid uh, uh, thinking that um, mitigating climate change will only done will only be done with uh, more of the same. So that's that's uh, very promising. Now uh, let me turn to uh, Livia Rivera do Souza. Uh, Li uh, Livia, uh, you you are um, co-founder and chief technology officer of Minicrete, a spin-off of uh, Cambridge University, and uh, you're working on a self-healing concrete solution. So again, inspired by nature. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, to begin with, thanks for the invitation to be in this event. Um, it's I'm very flattered and good afternoon, everybody. So bear with me on a little bit of science in this afternoon, um, but we are going to start talking about why there are so many cracks in concrete. And what happened is concrete, it's widely used and it's, uh, that's because it's widely available as well, but also because it's very good under compressive load, but not as good under tensile load. And that's why typically we place rebars inside of concrete to kind of balance out a little bit of those tensile forces. However, if small cracks are formed, what happens is um, contaminants can enter in the concrete and uh, corrosion can take place in the rebar. And that's why typically when you go to coastal areas, you can see much more corrosion or corroded surface uh, together with, um, in the UK in the winter, they put salt in the roads as well and that chloride can escalate the process of corrosion. Um, and with a result of that, what happens is that a lot of money is spent on repair and maintenance actions. And that's a problem because then what we are talking about, um, as we all know, is that cement is one of the fundamental materials used in the production of concrete. And 
during the production of cement, it's around 7 to 8% um, of CO2 emissions during the calcination process. And um, there are a lot of projects to use less cement, like calcined clays or um, blast furnace slag. Um, but uh, still, there is no clear alternative to it, to it quite yet. And with the growth in population, we know that um, the number of use of concrete is just going to increase. And we also know that 37% of um, CO2 emissions are associated with the total built environment, and that together with actions of repair and maintenance. So um, in the past 10 years or so in, at Cambridge, we're investigating um, self-healing technology for cementitious materials. And that's, again, um, similar to what Bruno was saying. It's mimicking what happens in nature. So if there is a scratch on a tree or there is a scratch on our own skin, there is a self-healing capacity in our own body. And nature has that capacity as well. So um, we are mimicking that. We are borrowing that lesson and applying that for um, our infrastructure. And the way we do it is by embedding healing agents inside of the uh, infrastructure, either in discrete elements as capsules or in continuous systems as a vascular system to deliver the healing agent. And, um, and with that, we can extend the service life of the infrastructure because we are decreasing all actions that could be associated with repair and maintenance of that infrastructure. Um, we tested that system in the lab, and it's um, showing a lot of potential, but now um, we started Mimicrete to investigate pathways for commercializing that technology, particularly focusing on the scaling up, but also establishing partnerships to de-risk the technology in, um, in, in application in the relevant environment. And the results that we see with this kind of technology is that it's kind of twofold. On one side, we can see the decrease of actions that are associated with repair and maintenance. But then on the other side, we have outcomes like, if you go back to the um, why the steel, why the rebar is needed in concrete, um, by enhancing the capacity of concrete of heal itself and close those craps, cracks by itself, uh, we can decrease the amount of steel that it's used. And um, we have reports saying that we can decrease the amount of steel of up 35%, which is um, quite a pronounced number for in terms of sustainability. And we are also keen on investigating how we can decrease the amount of cement that can be used once that um, self-healing technology is deployed. That's absolutely uh, astonishing. Uh, minus 35% steel, lengthened duration uh, for uh, the material itself. Uh, a wonderful example of a uh, new approach, how innovation can help on sustainability. And uh, these two examples are, are part of the biomimetic technologies, which is impressive because they are um, inspired by nature. So. Uh, if, if now we move to the corporate world, uh, Florent, Florent Drillon, you're in charge of uh, sustainability services at Capgemini. And when, when you talk to your clients, are they all thinking, as we heard before, you know, like um, 10 years back, I had on my agenda digital, five years ago, sustainability, and now geopolit ge geopolitical uncertainties. That really resonates and sounds like constraints. Are they all? looking at sustainability and circular economy as a constraint? Thank you, Lucia, for this uh, very uh, accurate question. Uh, indeed, we discuss a lot with uh, all our uh, executive clients, and uh, circular economy has been on around for quite some time. It's not a new concept. But uh, we are still stagnated at around 9% of circularity in the material that are injected back in the economy today. Uh, and thus, there are a lot of incentives, as you mentioned, the sustainability imperative, clearly. We heard a lot of very uh, interesting discussion this morning also about the geopolitical pressure and the lack or the difficulty to, also to access to materials, uh, which raises a lot of new questions regarding sovereignty. 
uh, the price of lithium has gone up and the price of battery using lithium has gone up this year for the first time in a decade. So uh, it's, it, sh it would be time to increase uh, circularity. The difficulty when you compare it to the digital transformation is that digital transformation was adopted faster, first by addressing customer. Sustainability and circularity, the difficulty to put it in place, and, uh, uh, and that also explains why it is so slow, is that you have to rethink completely your business model and your operating model and your supply chain. And that's uh, exactly what the executive tells us. We recently did a report on circularity, and 70% of the executive we, we uh, address tell us it's complicated. Uh, the reason why circularity is not enforced massively, scaled up, except at innovative uh, companies like uh, we, we, we see today, it's the scale of the transformation that is required. The lack of incentive, uh, financially, some companies still see that it takes more time to have a return on investment on circularity project than traditional project. And uh, the, the lack of skills and capability to uh, implement those. Uh, the good news, uh, if, if I may so, say so, is that we have more and more uh, triggers to go toward more circularity. The first one is the circular, uh, the, the sustainability imperative. Uh, we've had great example of how using circular, uh, using a biomimicry uh, principle, regenerative principle can reduce GHG emission. But it is also seen as a, for 50% of the executive we, we interrogated as a source of cost reduction. And uh, as well, there is a lot of innovation that enables uh, circularity. Bio, bio, uh, biotechnology, synthetic uh, biology clearly is one of them, as well as the convergence between the physical world and the digital world. A lot of the circular uh, economy principles were just principles and were not really easy to implement in the past beyond uh, burning waste uh, to produce uh, heat or, or energy. Now, with uh, the uh, development of a lot of new uh, technology and the fact that everything is connected, you are able to uh, develop circularity. For instance, uh, the, the emergence of platforms that enable you to go toward uh, more sharing economy. Uh, you know, instead of selling car, you sell uh, the access to a car. That's what we see with. Uh, uh, companies which are uh, enabling car sharing, for instance. But as well as the traceability, which is, has been seen as a major issue to enable circularity. And we have now, uh, somebody mentioned uh, a cryptocurrency, but the technology behind it can also be used for traceability reasons and also to enable what is difficult today, which is the reverse logistic principle. So being able to trace your product down to their usage uh, point, but also organize the new supply chain and gather them back to be reassembled, refurbished, and reused. So technology is clearly a level and an innovation that will help us accelerate the move to our circular economy. That, that's interesting. Th thank you, Florent. And um, th there is an interesting link to be made between uh, the shift to uh, circular economy and our ability to go faster on the energy transition. I, th I believe uh, you've done a recent survey for France that tells a lot around that. Can you give us a little bit yeah. more insight? Yes, so we, we worked with the French uh, National Institute for Circular Economy and the ask was, uh, given the constraints we have on uh, resources uh, due to the different crises that we discussed today, but also due to the ambitious target that we have uh, to reach the decarbonization of our economy, is it sustainable? I mean, you mentioned the planetary boundaries. Uh, clearly, uh, we've been burning, uh, I think, around 1.7 er, Earths in usage of material. Uh, if everybody was living like France or UK, that would be 2.6. Uh, so that there's clearly a need to go toward more circularity. I think around 100 billion tons of material are used every year. So that's uh, four or five, almost five times more than during the period of the clover of Rome in 1972. So that's clearly not sustainable. And the study we did was to show how to enable the energy transition, leveraging circularity principle, which are uh, avoid, uh, reuse, replace, uh, and, and uh, refurbish. And uh, what we found is that applying all these levers would enable to, uh, to uh, 
to unlock 70% of the need of material and minerals that are needed to produce the equipment that are, uh, in, uh, that are required for the energy transition, like the solar panels, the batteries, the electric cars, etc. etc. And that could lead to reducing, uh, and that the figure is close to what you were saying, uh, uh, around 40% of the GHG emissions. So circular economy is not uh, nice to have, I believe, in the, in the journey to our energy transition and sustainability. It's really a must. Uh, but it, it means also changing the, the mindset and seeing beyond uh, just uh, recycling, but opening to new business models, such as shared economy, and also going back to uh, sustainable product design, so thinking a product right from the start that is not only performant, which is what companies have been doing for years, delivering a very performant product, but delivering a product that is resilient and then can be used in other value chain, in other, uh, in other uh, uh, industries. So circularity is part of the answer to uh, enable faster energy transition. And on, on that affordability question, there is uh, scarcity of some of these resources, but there is also a question, for instance, on hydrogen. Green hydrogen is very promising, but raises a huge question of affordability and cost. So, Yusung, you've been giving some thought on that very precisely. Can you share them with us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think the, mo the most important factor going forward in, uh, to bring down uh, hydrogen costs so that they can be affordable to customers is, uh, without doubt, government subsidy. Uh, hydrogen is, very ex is an ex expensive fuel right now. Uh, the basic rationale behind the economics of hydrogen is that uh, the cost will come down as, uh, as producers of e electrolyzers like Linde of, of Germany, Air Product of France, and Siemens, uh, as they build more, uh, produce more uh, electrolyzers, their production costs will come down. So uh, this will drive uh, the, the, the prices for hydrogen down along with uh, lower renewable energy costs. But uh, according to Bloomberg New, uh, New Energy Finance, uh, currently in 2022, the cost of producing green hydrogen in Korea is $7.85. Uh, they forecast this uh, price to come out, this uh, cost to come down to $2.47 by uh, 2030 and to $1.43 by uh, 2050. But um, what I am concerned uh, recently is that simply the demand for hydrogen is not growing as fast as we would like them to. Um, in Korea, for example, uh, the, the government's initial plan uh, by the end of 2000, this year, 2022, uh, was to have 67,000 hydrogen cars out in the market uh, selling and running. Um, as of the end of October of this year, uh, that number was 27,870 cars. So only 43% of the target has been met. So, so why is this? Um, uh, in term, uh, when you look at uh, customer burden, burden uh, I think that customers are very well subsi uh, subsidized uh, in when they buy their hydrogen cars. Uh, for example, uh, the price of a Hyundai Nexo, which is the uh, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen car offered by uh, Hyundai, uh, the price tag is $57,000. And what the government does is that they uh, provide around $26,000, uh, which is around 46%. So customers can buy a Hyundai Nexo for uh, $31,000. This is uh, roughly uh, the same as a mid-size SUV, Hyundai Santa Fe, uh, out in the market. So uh, definitely, uh, customers uh, are not losing by buying a uh, 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 hydrogen car in Korea. Um, in terms of fuel costs, uh, there is a, a de facto uh, price uh, cap on uh, the price of hydrogen uh, that is used uh, to fuel the cars, uh, which is around at around $7 per kilogram. But um, if you want to compare the, uh, uh, the cost of hydrogen to, to diesel 
and, and gasoline, uh, you have to uh, compare it in terms of how many uh, kilometer it's going to go uh, for every, uh, uh, how much it costs for ev every kilometer uh, that the car is running. Uh, so uh, for hydrogen cars, uh, the cost is 9.5 cents per kilometer. Um, for gasoline, uh, that's uh, 11 cents. And for diesel is 10.6 cents. So in terms of fuel, uh, customers there, again, are definitely uh, having incentives to buy uh, hydrogen cars. Uh, but I, uh, in the end, customers, they complain, why aren't, when we ask them, why aren't you buying more uh, hydrogen cars? What they complain is about, there's not enough fueling stations out there for them to refuel their cars. So, um, uh, and if you ask hydrogen suppliers, uh, like Hyosung, uh, we complain, hey, there's not enough vehicles out there for us to make, uh, build more uh, hydrogen stations. Yeah. So uh, this dilemma really becomes a classic uh, a question of which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you look at the uh, graph uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the presentation uh, on, on, on the screen, uh, that, that is, uh, the average loss uh, incurred by a single hydrogen station in two th 2021 was $76,000. Um, the government covered around 61% of those costs, but that's, that doesn't include include the 50% uh, depreciation costs for, the, for actually investing in the facilities. Uh, the government uh, gives you money, 50% uh, of the money that you need to build a uh, hydrogen station, but they don't uh, uh, provide funding for the other 50%. Uh, so that, that is incurred as a, co as a cost to the uh, hydrogen uh, fuel stations. So if you factor in this depreciation cost, uh, the coverage of government subsidy is only around 40%. So, I mean, if you're, if you're losing uh, money every year, I mean, I don't think businesses are gonna uh, build more uh, hydrogen stations. So the basic rationale behind hydrogen is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, more demand, uh, producing more electrolyzers, uh, bringing down the cost. But if uh, demand is, is not picking up as high as, as we would like, then uh, do you think really uh, the makers of uh, electrolyzers, would they be producing more electrolyzers? No, and I think uh, this is where I think the government has to uh, really think about uh, uh, in what volumes do they want to subsidize the hydrogen industry? So yeah. definitely uh, government uh, funding is the most important uh, factor between now and 2030 and 40 until uh, the price of hydrogen really becomes affordable to uh, customers. Oh, thank you. Th thank you, you assume because on, on the back of uh, this illustration, very pragmatic and detailed illustration on, uh, based on, I, b I assume, Korean market, uh, it, it's clear that uh, uh, for the hydrogen, it's an entire value chain in, in order to, for it to become, you know, uh, a retail, I including up to the cars, a source of uh, uh, affordable energy, it requires a lot of investments uh, and, um, and not only subsidies uh, for the end consumers. So that, that definitely uh, calls for a question regarding, and I'm turning to, to Andrew Brown, um, uh, regulation has an impact. We will see, uh, first it creates a momentum. Uh, when it's mandatory, it incentivizes behaviors. Um, and there is, uh, w that's one aspect of the coin. The other aspect is um, public policies can incentivize also with subsidies the use of this uh, energy or the other and behaviors in general. How do you look at it from the OECD standpoint? Uh, yes, so the, the OECD, I think, is a wonderful forum for our member countries to have conversation with one another, to explore what has been working, what are the lessons learned from policies. 
And I think that there are three angles that we're taking a look at uh, that are quite important. And the first being that there's not necessarily going to be one silver bullet which solves the circular economy problem. And so rather we're looking at a policy mix and how can you combine several policies to create the incentives such that the sustainable or the environmentally friendly choice is the one that's the most obvious choice. Uh, and so this begins by taking a look along the life cycle. When we talk about products, they have impacts, environmental impacts from their extraction, during their use, all the way to the end of life. And so if you have a, just a singular focus on one of these parts, you will miss the larger picture. Um, and when we take a look as well, we, we see there are opportunities. You mentioned regulation. Regulation has a role in removing some of the most obviously hazardous elements of products to remove them from the market to make sure that they're not creating problems, as well with design. When we know a particular design makes sense, this can have a particular role. Then there are price-based mechanisms, such as subsidies or taxes, to make that choice the obvious choice. As well, at the OECD, we have been looking at extended producer responsibility for over 30 years. This is taking a look at making producers responsible for the post-consumer or the post-use stage of the life cycle to incentivize better design choices. Um, then we talk about another angle for policy that we've looked at is around geography. So with circular economy, I think that the average citizen may have their first interaction with circular economy with the public sector in terms of their municipality, that it's often the municipalities that are doing recycling systems. Uh, and so this starts at a very local stage, but also there are domestic at the national level as well as at international level that are quite important for making policies for uh, circular economy. So you mentioned uh, that uh, there was the biodiversity. This angle is there's the meeting happening with the Convention on Biological Diversity this week. Last week it was plastics. So having an international focus is going to be critical. When we talk about plastics, we ran two different scenarios of our macroeconomic model and determined that it would require an internationally focused policy to really move us towards where we want to be with the capture of plastic waste and the recycling levels that we seek. And then the, the last bit that I'll mention is around justice. So I think that this has been something that has been lacking in previous discussion around mm. environmental policy. Uh, but uh, when we talk about this at a national level, this can mean providing for underserved, previously underserved communities, making sure that we're contacting them and involving them in the policy making process. Uh, also at an international level, you have to make sure that when we're building these new economic systems that they're just. If they're not just, they're not really sustainable. And when we talk about plastics, one example here uh, we could uh, bring in is around the OECD. We did a study on the cost of capturing all plastic waste to making sure that this was no longer leaking to the environment. When we looked at the least developed countries, there was a cost saving at having a circular policy ambition as compared to a linear policy approach. So there are opportunities when we look at an internationally just system as well that this can make sense financially as well. Interesting. So that's a very comprehensive uh, uh, approach to the cycle. And that, that leads me to uh, turn to uh, our friends from uh, startups. Because very often, uh, definitely when we hear how promising your solutions are, we can't wait to have them um, scale in terms of production and adopted widely. So what do you see, I'm turning to you, Livia, what do you see if, if you had a wish list uh, do you see any uh, regulatory uh, feature that could help you on that path? If you had asked only what is my wish list, I would say just money. We just need more money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on regulations, um, I like what Thierry said in the morning, if I understood correctly. He said um, Real, realism uh, at short term and uh, idealism in the long term. So in the short term, um, I hope that's what he said. Um, forgive Pragmatism. if not. From oh, it was good. good. Um, so for us, it's it's also uh, kind of around um, the way the regulations are. So we are trying to implement a new technology in an industry that has been around for two thousand years, of a technology that has been around for what. 20 years, 30 years. So we are talking about a tr time frame of 1%. So it takes time and it should take time because what we want is our, that our infrastructure, it's very safe f 
first and foremost is safety of everybody involved. Um, but right now, to implement a new technology um, on a construction, and we have a case on working with um, a company in the UK as well, it takes time. We need a, a, a deviation from standard, and it, it takes departure from um, standard, sorry. Um, and it can take from a few weeks all the way to a couple of years. So I think uh, what we are doing right now is to liaising with um, organs in the UK that are responsible for the standardization of our products. But in the long term, the vision that we have is that the codes can be changed to consider that technology. And there are other um, self-healing um, cementitious materials company there up and running. And um, what I envision in a way is that in maybe 10 years or 20 years, you're going to see the changes in the Euro code. And it's going to say, well, using traditional cement, that's the amount, that's the guideline for it. Using self-healing cementitious materials, that's the guideline for it. And I think that's going to be speed up our process quite a lot. So uh, prescriptive, yeah. prescriptive regulation, uh, yeah. you would call uh, for. Bruno, on your side, uh, is the list that Andrew uh, shared with us exhaustive, or are you suggesting something else? Oh, it's very exhaustive. Uh, what Andrew shared with us and Florent as well, uh, it's, it's quite comprehensive. To move to circularity, uh, for me, what is important, uh, if I may say, is that we square the circle. So we have several issues everywhere. We need industrial strengths. We need investment into biotechnology, which is also close to the chemical sector at the level that we see in the pharmaceutical industry, for instance. You, you are amazed because health is such a problem, but the waste we are generating are also causes, causing health problems. So we need to invest in this, uh, in this industry. We need to have access to the feedstock, which is the, the waste, the quality, and, and this access. So we need to develop a collection and sorting and just move away from the incineration and the landfilling, uh, which is not uh, what we should be doing. We need to put the asset at scales. And so there is also an investment needed. We need to accelerate. And the chemical sector will need some money to invest in these things. And we need also customer commitments. And here is probably where the regulatory pressure can help or incentivize. And for me, what is interesting is that today you have in some countries, like in China, you cannot use waste to make food grade contact material, but you can use oil. And I doubt that anyone in this room will drink a little bit of oil and feel safe. So why a dirty material like oil, which contains a lot of nasty chemicals, even radioactive material can be used to make food grade contacts where our waste, which are not clean, but can be very clean when you go through, through these kind of technologies, cannot be used to make food grade contacts. So you have a lot of roadblocks that are being built, even circulating the waste from one country to the next country, just to use them and reuse them is quite difficult. So regulatory need to build a policy around what we are generating, not using in the proper way to enable and to facilitate the use of this waste. And for the customer or for the consumer, of course, there is some education. Our waste, our resources are not anymore something that we throw away without taking care of where they are ending up, including in the ocean. So, yeah, very interesting to definitely uh, looking at waste in a different way, a change of paradigm down to regulation is also needed to allow for circular economy to, uh, to become mainstream. So um, before opening to question, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the, the spirit of this session was to share with you a little bit of the positive spin that we feel when we look at uh, innovative, promising solutions um, and, and that they go hand in hand with regulation. Regulation uh, shouldn't lag behind uh, because we well see that uh, uh, adoption can be hindered if there is a lag behind in the perception, in the taxonomy, in the alignment, and not only in the reporting. So all this needs to work in parallel uh, for uh, energy transition uh, to, to move faster than what we've seen up to now, and, and um, if we want to reach the net zero by 2050. Uh, thank you.
And now we are, I suggest we open to a few questions from the room. I know we're late, but... <laughs> I am Meir Shitrit from Israel. I enjoy to listening to you. It's very encouraging to see that really there is a chance to change the situation of the world in the future. Uh, I'm glad also as well that uh, um, it's funny that the president of uh, Brazil had lost the election. Yes. Because now maybe they will stop <laughs> the destroying of the Amazon forest, which contribute a lot to the quality of life. I wonder if you hear about some of the uh, some of the methods that now are checked in Israel by high-tech people. They think that it is possible, maybe, to develop things that will absorb mm. the carbon mm -hmm. from the air. Uh, I don't know how and how in which way, but uh, they think about some kind of way that they can really absorb the carbon from the air, and by that they will reduce strongly the situation, will change the situation for best. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you heard, heard about it, or you know something about it. Thank you. Yeah, very quickly, because there uh, can be a very long conversation around direct air capture technologies. Uh, but we have a, a, a company in, uh, in the West Coast, and they're working on, on projects like that, which is uh, basically biomimicry, uh, copying nature, and by using material that have the ability to transform and to capture uh, carbon out of the air. So yes, there's a lot of innovation in that field. It's in the early stage of, uh, I'd say, uh, science, but it's, uh, there's a lot of investment in this stage. Yeah, um, just to make a comment that as a Brazilian, I'm very happy that Lula won as well, um, and that we have a little bit more chance with the Amazon forest. And, um, and it's interesting when you go to meetings about um, cement producers in the UK, and they are mainly talking about the possibility of carbon capture, and that's very fundamental for that industry as well. Um, yeah, I, I know that there are some technologies out there, but there is a lot to be developed still on that front as well. Yeah. Bruno, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add one comment, which is general to what to everything we are developing here, is that even if you look at new technology, you mm. still need to produce materials to make those technology efficient. So this kind of huge vacuum cleaner that can capture CO2 will use a lot of minerals to be built, this kind of ceramics or zeolites from what I've uh, learned about these technologies. And we still have the issue of the raw materials. We need to be more circular because to build those mm. huge materials, use vacuum cleaner, we still have the issue of what we do with the waste we are generating today. So we need to address the circularity, reduce our consumptions of raw materials. And those ceramics, they need to be mined. Uh, it's a lot of issues also when you are mining the ground. Mm. It, our iPhones or our telephones, if you are a Samsung uh, lover, uh, they, they weigh only 500 grams, but actually, if you were carrying them with what the waste you are generating, they will be tens of kilos. Absolutely. Good question there. Uh, thank you for this fascinating uh, panel. I love, in particular, the biomimetics idea. Uh, very inspiring that nature can teach us how to protect nature. Um, question is the following. I see you combine some regulations, some incentives. Um, there's a need for money. But I was thinking, why not find a circular funding mechanism? By that, I mean making sure, building on what you just said, uh, that those who produce materials that's going to generate a lot of waste, pay for it. So including the price of goods, the price of waste, ultimately, so the, what we called in the past the externality negative. Huh? Uh, so this is something I'd like to have your views on. How can we create a self-funding mechanism where the mainstream funds the future? Oh, okay, I'd be happy to answer that. So I, I tried to touch on that just a bit. Uh, this I would call extended producer responsibility. Uh, so in the OECD, our definition of this is taking the post-use stage and making the producer either financially or physically, in some cases, responsible for this. And so we have a, a quite a wide definition of which policies fall into this overall approach. 
but uh, you could think of deposit refund systems, you could think of take back requirements on the producers, you could think of financial obligations at the point of production, and then we would call this an advanced disposal fee, and that these are used quite extensively throughout the OECD. I think we have just about all of our members have something in the form of a packaging EPR at the moment, <laughs> but we're also taking a look at how this can be applied to additional product sectors, so plastics beyond packaging, we're also considering construction, uh, food production, and waste, and seeing is this something that could be applied to more than just the traditional packaging application. And as well, we're looking at what possibility could be done to address more of the environmental impacts as they occur throughout the life cycle and including this within the producer's realm of responsibility. So this is definitely something that we are looking at. Thank you for the question. Bruno, do you, you, yeah. you raised your hand. Did you have any addition to make? Yes, uh, I, I think Andrew summarizes pretty well. Uh, the EPR, the extended responsibility for the producer, is one way of collecting money. And if it's done cleverly, so for instance, you put more money to be uh, taxed when you put a material which is difficult to produce, which is producing a lot of CO2 and very difficult to recycle, then you are generating extra revenue and force the people to be more clever in their design of products. Wonderful. So with this, uh, I, I've, I've seen big signs saying that we needed to stop because I think we're late on schedule uh, in the afternoon. We thank you all for uh, your time and your attention, and we definitely can continue the discussion uh, over uh, lunch, breakfast, and, and in the next days. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.